Hello, and welcome to the Animus Island Podcast, a weekly podcast focusing on everything Assassin's Creed community, news, and discussion. I am one of your hosts, Krakenway, and with me today, as usual, are our hosts, Ares. Hello, friends. And Aftermath1231. <laughs> I'm so sick. <laughs> and we don't have a guest this week, uh, but we will be discussing, well, we'll start very briefly with a question we were asked. Then there's a the announcement of a Ubisoft theme park, which we'll talk about. And then we'll go on to talk about uh, the announcement of Syndicate's Composer. I'm very excited about that news. And then we'll talk a little bit about the recruit system in Brotherhood Revelations 3 and possibly what we think, where we think it could go in the future. So, we have the question ready? Um, first, I thought we'd just talk a little bit about what we've been doing this week, you know? Like, okay. uh, like you should just shoot the shit for a little bit. It's funny that the guest is quickly becoming the exception rather than the norm because <laughs> scheduling is so much more difficult as soon as everyone's back at school, back at work. Um, it's mm-hmm. actually becoming a bit more difficult. But we think that next week should be pretty good. I have been saying it for the last three weeks, though, so I don't know. <laughs> yeah, last week was supposed to be really good. Yeah, usually I'm able to put everything together, but it's like, hey, McCrackenway and I are moving house to go to college. Everyone else is moving house to go to college. Everyone else is starting up work, and it's like, yeah. Yeah. So, yeah, sorry. <laughs> yeah. So, things we did this week. I played through Dishonored uh, again, which cool. was a ton of fun. It's been a few years since I did that. Um, did you get any of the super hard achievements? I did not get any of the super hard ones, like no kills, no deaths, things like that, but I did yeah. get a few other ones because I went with some other choices. Man, like, Fair enough. playing through it again, and a few years later especially, it has, like, really enlightened me as to, like, how many options are in that game, because everyone mm-hmm. talks about that. And, but I thought it was kind of like, because it's been a while since I played it, and so I just remember it being kind of, you know, like, the illusion of choice. And now that I played it, I was like, there's this one section... That was that I remember being super hard and stuff, and so I was really dreading it. And I was getting up close to it, and I decided that I'd try and look around for some more collectibles you want, you first. Want to tell us which section this is? I don't want to spoil it, but I guess it's, it's a, um it's a several year old game. Okay, it was the um the when you're finding Sokolov in his uh, house on the bridge. Oh yeah. Uh, yeah. And so uh, when I first played it a few years ago, I went through the house, which is easily one of the most difficult things you can do in the game. And so this time I was like really dreading getting up to that. And mm-hmm. so this time I was actually looking around for some collectibles to get, try and get prepared before I had to go through that gauntlet. And I found a route up onto the roof. And so instead of fighting through this massive house with all these different guards, I just climbed onto the roof and stealthily snuck up and killed him and brought him back. And, like, mm-hmm. it was amazing that there was something that was... I had this other option that was so different from what I thought was the only one. And it kind of made me realize just how deep yeah. um, Dishonored is. It's a little bit startling how um, not, how many choices there are and things in that game. Mm-hmm. That game I realized... Wait, go ahead. Yeah, it gives you a lot of options. I, that was... Yeah, go on. I realized how much choice and you know freedom you have in that game when I started checking out some of the um, uh, like hyper speedruns of someone just coming up with the most creative and murderous ways to get through the game. And it's unbelievable what some people come up with. It's like shoot a crossbow firebolt into the air, blink around, stab this one guy, toss a barrel over, and then by the time you're over at the exit, the first crossbow bolt will land on the guys and blow them up, and then you can get... It's, it's just, there's so much crazy stuff people have thought of. It's unbelievable. Yeah, that game's completely insane. Um, mm-hmm. And I'm really looking forward to Dishonored too. Yes. If you haven't space. played, um, if you haven't played the DLC as well for Dishonored, it's really good as well. I'll have to get around to checking that out. I haven't yet. Yeah, yeah I never played the DLC. The power, yeah, they mi- they mix up the powers you have. Um, I think it's a bit harder as well. Uh, so if you like that stealth stuff, it's definitely something you should check out. Um, and it just feels it's it's just different enough that it feels like a really fresh experience. I think. And other stuff this week, I um. I actually have started playing Brotherhood finally after being so busy recently and I'm actually playing it right now. Um, and so maybe my review will be up uh, soonish because I have another three-day weekend success. Uh, uh, and I'm having a ton of fun with that game so I'm going to have quite a bit to talk about with Brotherhood. Uh, but I'm especially looking forward to getting to like Revelations in 3 where my opinions might be slightly more controversial and out of the norm 
because I think most people can agree that AC2 and Brotherhood are just like really good games. Some people might mm-hmm. argue that Brotherhood was just a bit of a rehash of AC2. Um, it's a good rehash. The yeah, mechanics exactly. changed a lot though, like mm-hmm. in terms of, I mean, just the, the new combat system and then the recruits that can make the new combat system entirely pointless because you can just kill everybody with them. Yeah, and but, we'll talk a little bit about those later on in this episode. Mm-hmm. Anything else you guys did this week before I get to the question? Um, I finished Arkham Knight, sort of. Uh, just last night, uh, I got to the not-quite ending, because there's like an, a half ending, and then the, the rest of the ending. Um, I got to the, the half ending point, point. it was really cool. I, I really liked the way it all turned out, um, how you end up uh, beating the, the baddie, um, I thought was, was very clever. But That's I won't right. spoil that, because spoilers. Yeah, <laughs> Go play it, it's game. great. All right, so... Uh, Connor, anything else you want to say before we get to the question? Um, well, I mean, I've, I've been having Ethernet troubles, and a guy came in yesterday and made it better, but it still doesn't work, really. Um, it's weird. I can now play games online with other people, but I cannot download things unless I'm prepared to wait for 70 hours, or 99 plus hours in some cases. Jeez. Uh, and I cannot access the PlayStation Store at all. So, Ouch. yeah, it's just, it's rough. I, I was intending to keep up with the marathon with Revelations, but I got here and Ethernet was down and I just entirely missed it, and I'm still missing it. So we've got a question this week from Evelzorus Prime, aka Multiverse Games, um, and he wants to know, how long do you think the Assassin's Creed series will last as a popular title? If the series yeah. does end, how would you want the story to conclude? Hmm. Um... I think it may go sort of the way of Prince of Persia, where, although it's, it's a different scenario, we have, well, with the whole, you know, Darby writing um, a bunch of, you know, hundreds of years of first civilization history to be teased over the next, like, 10, 20 years was, I think, a bit of hyperbole. But they were talking about cycles in the AC games. We had the Desmond cycle, then the interim with Unity, uh, or the interim with AC4. And then we have the new cycle starting with Unity going on with Syndicate and more. So I suspect... Interim, but, you know. uh, wait, what was that, McCracken? They, they also reference it as an interim yeah. uh, section So now. I suspect okay. that this will be, I would hope, um, the last uh, of the annualizations when they finish up with this cycle. So maybe Syndicate and one other game. Or maybe, like the first cycle, there will be two major trilogies and one other game. Uh, around that, but anyway, the point is, um, what I would kind of hope for is that they find a nice little wrapping up point, sort of like with Desmond's story, at the end of whatever the current saga they're working on is, and then they start doing a game every two years, and then every three years, and then it just kind of fades away, sort of like Prince of Persia did, because we had the nice trilogy, and then some other games after that, and then it just kind of eh, disappeared, and I would probably be okay with that. Yeah, I like that idea, actually, that sounds, that sounds pretty cool. Um, it sounds like a good way to include it. So, how long do you think that will be around then? Uh, as um, a series? Annualized? Maybe like four or five years. Um, and then after that, I think ten is probably like the last we'll see of AC. That'd be my guess. Okay. Yeah, that sounds... Yeah, it's pretty long term as well. And they'll have the movie and things out. Do you think yeah. that the series will end... Do you think the transmedia will end the same time as the games end? Or do you think that maybe... Uh, the Assassin's Creed series could continue on as graphic novels. I would hope that it would, because that's a very low-budget way to keep the people who really like the game engaged and still, you know, getting a little bit of money out of them. But uh, you wouldn't, you know, get the ire of the internet of, oh, Assassin's Creed 27 is coming out this year. They added a teleporter this time. So I, <laughs> I'm joking, mm-hmm. but I just, I think transmedia, like comics and stuff, would be a great way to keep it going. And I think the introduction of a lot of comics this year is sort of the beginning of that. But uh, I've been talking too much from Crackaway. What do you think? Um, well, I think that's an interesting idea. I think the they might by by ending the series and continuing with Transmedia, they might stop getting the ire of that an annualized series gets. But they are going to get the ire since they're still putting out the story. People are going to be like, "We still want a full game." Um, oh man, there's I don't know. It would probably be slightly like. Probably not quite the same, but similar to the way that Kingdom Hearts 3 has been happening. Because it's like, 
everybody has wanted a Kingdom Hearts 3 for a long time, but they've had, like, so many interim titles between 2 and 3, I guess, and people really want, like, the full experience again, rather than... Because a lot of them, since they're, they, they were relegated to, like, handhelds and stuff. Um, and I think the thing with... If you're continuous transmedia, you get a similar thing where people are like, you know, the story continuum is nice and all, but I really miss playing an actual game now. Um, but at the same time, I don't know. I don't think there's a nice way for... An easy way for Assassin's Creed to end. Um, at least not with the annualization in it. I think it's... They, they would have to, like, definitely to have a satisfying ending plan at several years in advance and then have an arc that concludes and then you're done. I mean, don't most you know franchises span two generations, maybe maybe three, because we've had you know mm. since the beginning of PS3 we've had AC1, and then we're going into the PS4, and however long that lasts, another you know five six years, however yeah. much. Uh, I feel like annualization could go to roughly the end of the PS4 era, and then after that, it's just you know a little trickle. So I mean, think of like you know Jack and Daxter and those games. Right? Like it was back in the old console games, but. Now it's like haven't seen one of those in ten years. Yeah. Yeah, it's interesting. I think that Assassin's Creed is going to keep going as long as it makes money, and I think that we have a bit more time with that. As, um, and I think that like how Syndicate does is definitely going to affect the long term outlook for the series because after Unity, if it's similar to Unity, like in any way then we can expect a sharp decline in the series, similar to Call of Duty in recent years, I think. Um, so not like one to two years and then AC's gone, but like over three or four years. Um, yeah. it'll start, sales will start to dwindle a bit um, and become go below what's kind of expected. But if Syndicate does really well and it's like AC4 or AC2, and remember it's one of the best, um, and those games are also remembered as doing something different than usual. Um, and so Syndicate looks to go that way with things like the gang mm -hmm. system and stuff like that. Yeah, I would hope so. Yeah. In terms of sales, though, one thing I've noticed is that, although we don't have specific data, um, AC3 and Unity both sold somewhere within the vicinity of the 12 million uh, copies mark. But um, 4 and I think... Uh, 4 and Revelations and Brotherhood and 2 all sold around the 10 million mark. So there's been a bit of a fluctuation between like, you know, Revelations up to 3, down to 4, up to Syndicate again um, in terms of sales. So I think if those numbers start going down, that would be something. But the funny thing is the better games have actually sold worse than because, the worse games. <laughs> that's because... Um the better games um, create more hype for the next game. Um, just like, because if, especially um, after AC3, I think the reason that AC4 didn't sell as well is because AC3 was kind of, I mean, definitely not pan, I wouldn't call it pan now because I've seen worse, but, um, you know, AC3 got some pretty high scores and some scores that were like, this is, eh. And then it's still one of the more divisive games of the franchise. Then the game immediately following it did not sell as well. And one of our top news stories this week is something that I don't think anyone even slightly saw coming. And that is that Ubisoft is making a theme park. I'm as confused as you are, viewer. Um, Aftermath uh, told me the fantastic quote of, have you ever played a video game and thought, you know what, I'd really like to experience this in a theme park? Nope, me neither. So what's going to happen is Ubisoft has made plans to build a theme park in Malaysia by 2020 that has rides and areas for franchises such as Assassin's Creed and others. I think um, the others were uh, something involving Rabbids, surely, for the kiddies. But what else was there, Aftermath? I've forgotten the other ones. Oh, I don't know. It's mostly Assassin's Creed, though. But the point is, uh, a theme park with Assassin's Creed and then some other stuff, which just seems so unwarranted, unnecessary, and confusing, and we're all very unsure as to what is even going on right now. So what do you guys think about this 
thing. It's it's really weird. Um, I mean, the one thing is like theme parks are supposed to be really whimsical, and a theme park focused on Assassin's Creed is can't be really whimsical. Like, contrary to what like the quote like. There are games that I think would probably go well in a theme park, but they are all, like, Nintendo games. Um, like, Mario would probably be pretty decent with the theme park, but um, the only Ubisoft franchise that I can think of that's even sort of whimsical at all in that way is Raymond and and the Rabbids, like you said. Um, like, I could see getting a couple of roller coasters out of Raymond levels, but I don't... I don't... That's, that's like That's, like, one world or one ride and then what else is there in the theme yeah. park i mean going to you know orlando or la is bad enough to go to a theme park but who's going to say daddy fly me to malaysia i really want to go on this one assassin's creed ride I, yeah it, just, that's it another doesn't thing. make sense no it's, one asked for this it's really funny that they actually have a quote in the ub blog um like press release and it says that malaysia is the second most visited country in asia and i think this is one of those things we don't want to be second best um and Making it one uh, thing it might be mentioning that the second best actually probably adds more insult to injury than uh, making their prospects sound any better. One thing it might be is perhaps I mean maybe Malaysia approached them wanting a theme park. Yeah. Uh, see, here's the here's the here's how those went. Okay. Um, I think there are there's a little bit more info in other places, but how this went down is that. Um, this uh, theme park company called, I didn't realize there were theme park companies, but it turns out there are, called RSG, which is based out of Malaysia, approached Ubisoft, um, I believe. And so they asked Ubisoft if they could have the rights to make one because I guess they thought they could make a profit out of it. And so while Ubisoft is screaming about how they have creative control, which is Ubisoft's new favorite buzzword, they... Um, it's being built and maintained by this theme, per- this excuse me, this theme park company in Malaysia. So um, Ubisoft only has like a supervisory role in the creation and ma- ma- um, uh, that's not good. And the repair in this in this theme park. Mm-hmm. Well, I think that the, probably the only people who would benefit from this at all are the people who either live in Malaysia at the moment or uh, are going to travel there for other reasons. So I think what's going to happen and i think this is possibly what ubisoft wants to happen because the announcement this announcement's kind of low key in the first place um i think part of it is like it's in malaysia it's really low key announcement um nobody in like the major markets like in uh the us or anything is going to go there um i think it i mean and it's also so far in the future it's going to be like a blip on the radar, and then people will probably forget about it. Like, I don't think you're going to hear a lot about it. I think Ubisoft just wanted the licensing money. Like, sure, build a theme park. Yeah. We'll uh, take that money to license Yeah, and I think that's... You. But they don't want, like, bad press from elsewhere in the world, so that's part of why being in Malaysia is kind of nice, because it's like, yeah. nobody's going to go to Malaysia and... I mean, the thing with theme parks is that it's mostly, you know, for kids and their kids' parents because they have to take the kids there. Someone Mm -hmm. roughly our age, you know, Assassin's Creed's target audience has almost zero reason at all to want to go to a theme park, let alone an Assassin's Creed theme park, let alone one in Malaysia. So it just, like, even the Star Wars theme park, like, a lot of the people who I uh, was watching videos for who were talking about that were like, this is cool, I guess, but it's going to be very kid-centric. And even though I love Star Wars, I don't think I'm going to enjoy it very much. So, I mean, that's even Star Wars, but something fairly quite obscure, like Assassin's Creed compared to Star Wars, is, like, it's just... I, I keep saying it makes no sense, but it, beyond the simple getting of the licensing and royalty fees, I don't understand, like, what brought this... Why? Why did this construction company pick Ubisoft? Yeah, well, it could have been literally anything. And Possibly they don't know much about the games industry <laughs> or games yeah. in general. Yeah, that's possible too. Um, so it's slated for 2020, which I think quite rarely does announcing something five years before it happens um, ever work out well. I don't see what the benefit of it, other than being like completely transparent. I don't see what the benefit of is in announcing it five years I think theme before. theme parks are generally announced 
several years before because for one thing it takes a while to be built yeah. um so I, I just think that's standard practice yeah uh, but it's like are you supposed to like keep up the excitement this is like your no. it's, it's I think, like it might be standard I, practice what I think, and what i said what i said before is that i don't i think they don't want us to be excited about this they want mm. us especially in the american market to just forget about it yeah like this is standard practice for theme parks and things like that but you know you're crossing into gaming world where they like at most at ideally an announcement should be six months before and at most it's like a year or two uh for people who play these games five years is a long way away like i'll be how old will i be i'll be 21 holy crap graduated by then yep wow Damn. okay yeah I don't know how many people who are fans of AC now are going to be interested, still interested in the series by then. I think we'll and have... even so, we just talked about when AC might die out, and that's going to be roughly the end of the, the PlayStation 4, Xbox One console cycle. So AC is going to be probably on the ropes by then. <laughs> yeah, I don't think they're going to focus too much on AC in this park ride. I think, as you guys said, it's probably going to be more like Rabbids and Rayman. Um, I think will be their really their only choice to try and make any money off this the one thing about this though is that what may have made them think it was a good idea is because the assassin's creed experience at comic-con the past two years has done so well because people like doing parkour the difference though as aftermath pointed out when we were talking about this on skype a few days back is there is a massive difference between running around and doing parkour in a theme park themed after assassin's creed and sitting in a chair and going on a roller coaster ride type thing and one of them works very well for Assassin's Creed because it's interactive and it's actually doing stuff. The other one is like all the Marvel rides where you sit in a chair, spin around, and Spider-Man saves you from Dr. Octopus. It just... No. And you can't forget that parkour is actually a core, uh, core pillar of the Assassin's Creed franchise, mm -hmm. and so it actually yeah, makes sense. Sitting in a chair. <laughs> yeah. Well, actually, in Unity, we were playing as a guy who is just sitting in a chair playing the game, so maybe... No, but in all those rides, it's we're just random people and it's the superheroes saving us. So we're not even Altair or Ezio in this case. It's just they're going to show up and be like, hey, person. But anyway, mm, whatever. It's just, no, It's why? all a little strange. Mm. I don't really have an explanation for it other than um, some of the broad things and licensing and fees and money and things like that. It really makes the most sense. And it says that Ubisoft Motion Pictures is going to have the creative control over it. What? Aren't mm. they the movie company? Yeah. I don't yeah, understand. I don't um, There's I, so many questions. I want yeah. to know what the talks on this were like. Unless my understanding of how a movie works into theme parks, um, maybe it's actually based around the AC movie. What about that? Yeah. Unless they, well, then I feel like they would have gotten started on this a while ago. Yeah, and, it, yeah. and I feel like also unless like they crank out a few more movies, like they try to go full Marvel like everybody else is trying to do, in that time I don't see that there's a call for it. Um, speaking of which, there will also be... I think we'll have also seen both parts of the third Infinity War by then. Since Jeez. by then, yeah. It's like, it's the rough equivalent of making a, the a theme park for Captain America 2 three years later. It just, it, it doesn't make sense. I'd go to that, though. <laughs> well, yeah, because it's Captain America. <laughs> anyway, let's move on. Biggest news of the week is that uh, Syndicate's composer has been announced, and it's Austin Wintery. Uh, for those of you who don't know, he's, I mean, he's a fantastic composer. He's uh, scored many video games before. Uh, most notable probably are Monaco, What's Yours Is Mine, and Journey. And he was nominated for a Grammy for Journey. It's a fantastic soundtrack for a fantastic game. Um, and, oh man, it's just, I'm very excited personally, as a musician. Uh, the theme is also out, so now you have two uh, full pieces out there that you can listen to. Um, the main theme and uh, the main menu theme, two different things. Um, there's also, you can find videos that are mostly focused on gameplay that have pieces of ambient music in them, but we also confirmed that there's ambient music uh, and there's Lots of, lots of, lots of goodies with this soundtrack. I'm, I'm very excited for it. 
What do you guys think? I am quite excited. Um, earlier in the summer, I heard rumblings that the rumor was Jesper Kids coming back, um, but those were mostly unfounded. This guy, I, I like his stuff. Uh, so far, what I've listened to, the two songs he said, I do prefer the Dido's Lament main menu theme song to the main theme overall, but that's just my taste. Um, I think it sounds great. I like that he's the guy who did Journey because, you know, that's a really good composer. And I think historically uh, with AC, we have Jesper Kidd, who was great. And then we had mm -hmm. Lorne Balfe, who was working with Jesper Kidd on the AC Revelation soundtrack and then did his own. And then we had Brian Tyler, who came out from, you know, completely outside of Ubisoft. He did a great job with AC4. Mm -hmm. And then we had um, for AC Unity, uh, one of the composers, or two, who worked with yeah. um, Brian Tyler on the AC4 soundtrack, and they did an okay, pretty good job, uh, just like Lauren Valf did. It was, you know, okay to great, or okay to good, whereas the, uh, Jesper Kidd and um, uh, Brian Tyler were great. And I think this guy, coming from outside with tons of experience, will do a mm -hmm. great job, because yeah. you know, oh. it follows that pattern. And yeah. also, for those of you interested, um, there's access, the Animus' interview with Jesper Kidd, it's also out, uh, and definitely yes, give read it a that, listen. Uh, or listen to it. Um, Isn't it a text interview? I think it's, I think it's just text, yeah. Aries, confusing. <laughs> oh, sorry. Uh, um, so, you one thing... Listen to, that's, I can't read, I have to listen to it. We've been over this. <laughs> yeah. Well, yeah, you're the butler. Yeah. Um, so, one thing I think was mentioned is that Austin Wintry has actually listened to all the other previous AC mm -hmm. OSTs, which is kind of important. I think that actually explains why people thought that he might be, um, why the composer might be Jesper Kidd or Lorne Balf, because he has taken inspiration from the earlier games in a way. Which is great. Yeah. The one thing he said, because I, I um, one thing he said in the thread, because he did show up in the thread, um, the announcement, uh, he said, um, so there are some elements from, like, Jesper Kidd's earlier scores, like that sci-fi orchestral mixed trade-off that we used to have. There's a little bit of that, but definitely less. And he's really he's he's influenced, but he's he says he's really trying to do something that is very different from previous AC soundtracks. And it sounds like it too. Uh, for those of you who've seen the first and second Sherlock Holmes uh, movies, uh, it sounds uh, quite a lot like that, in my opinion, uh, in terms of mm -hmm. not the actual sounds, but the feel of it. And I think it's both because they really, you know, nailed what we all think of as a Victorian setting. So uh, that I would I'd, I would say is is quite good. Now, uh, alongside the composer announcement, they also released the main menu theme on his SoundCloud. Uh, what did you guys think about that? Did the you main that awesome? theme. What did I say? Main menu theme. Fuck. Yeah, well, we had the main was... menu theme a wee while ago. And now we have the main theme. Yeah. So what did you guys think? And we discussed that in a previous episode, which you should totally go listen to. What did you guys think about the main thing? I think it's, I'm certainly, it definitely, like Ari said, it sounds like it would be right at home in uh, Robert Downey Jr. Sherlock Holmes movies. Um, I don't know. It Right now, it's kind of hard for me to pick out like something that I would call a theme, I guess. Like, um, I don't know. You mean the, the light motif, the, the recurring? Yeah, like a light motif. Yeah. It doesn't have to necessarily recur again because I think in AC4 soundtrack it really doesn't. Except no, there's da, na, 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 which happens everywhere in the soundtrack. It actually happens in only like a couple tracks, but um, well, a lot of them. I guess it. it <laughs> like at yeah, least but, seven. Um, um, what was I thinking? Like this doesn't have a theme that I can immediately pick out, um, and. Uh, for instance, like hum or whatever. Um, I don't know. It's if you've listened to like the Arkham Knight soundtrack, what they consider the theme there is kind of similar. Um, where it's really hard to pick out like a melody um, in itself. I feel one but, thing that's interesting is that this is one of the few times that. A AC Games main theme has had an actual name for it other than the just the game's name, True. and he called yep. this Bloodlines, mm -hmm. which is cool. I think you can actually hear because it's supposed to be inspired by the dichotomy between both 
the uh, upper and lower classes in Victorian London and also between Jacob and Evie, which I think you can hear quite well and I really like it. Mm -hmm. it's dark. I guess the main theme that you would probably hear initially is that opening piano melody. Um, kind of a lullaby. It's really nice. Yeah, I do like the way it sounds, although I, I also quite you know miss the ability to pick out um, part of it and think like, oh yes, that's that's the little I mean, melody like, that goes in the theme. Yeah, but I'm sure like as I AC3 listen to it more, I'll be that. able to pick it out. Yeah, and I mean, like after AC3, we just had like these epic themes that you can immediately just pick out. So maybe it's just that we're yeah. used to something different. Like, I mean, mm. AC3 had the oh man, just that one was the loudest. <laughs> And it maybe it will become more evident as we listen to the other tracks in the soundtrack, which, yeah, which we will have, get repeated. We'll have yeah. a full analyzation of as soon as that's released. Yeah, yeah. and uh, one of the things about that is that um, there are certain elements uh, of songs that, uh, in, for instance, the Assassin's Creed 2 soundtrack, um, there are two songs, I forgot what they're called entirely, but there are little bits um, of very short, you know, five, ten second melodies that are you know probably two or three layers down from the main sound, but they span in a couple different songs. And sometimes when I listen to them, I actually get confused about which one I'm listening to, um, because I think it may be Sanctuary and Tour of Venice. But uh, I hope they do stuff like that where they take little you know four or five note bursts and spread them out across a few different songs to tie it all together. And that would help to you know point towards that's the melody of it. But um, again, we'll have to wait and see. Yeah, I would be interested um, to see, um, because for instance in like uh, AC3 you have, um, like, uh, the, for instance, like the Connors theme leitmotif, and that shows up in multiple different contexts, um, like it shows up in the sad parts, but it also shows up in several more um energetic songs as well, so I'd be interested to see how, or hear, how this one might be used that way, if it indeed is. Um, it's really nice. Gosh, I, I hope it is. <laughs> yeah, so I actually really like the, I really like the songs we've heard so far, and it sounds really uh, somber, which is really different from something like uh, Black Flags, which is more of a... Um, it's a jolly pirate romp. Or yeah, at least it starts out that way. It sounds a bit more like that, and I basically just ignored Unity's soundtrack altogether because it just annoys me. Aw, um, that's nice. But uh, yeah, I'm really liking it so far, and I um, can't wait to listen to it. And it's gonna be interesting how the ambient music is handled because, from what Max said, we don't really have ambient music, but it kind of works more like, you know, you can just hear, uh, you can hear like the music will kind of follow you through the world and it'll be a little bit less disconnected from the world. Like maybe you'll pass a pub and you'll hear people singing a song inside and then maybe you'll pass um, someone playing an instrument on the street and you'll hear it continue through there. And you'll, um, so the music will kind of follow you. So it's I'm not like that. It'll sound too disconnected though, because it is a good, it's, it is a good idea, but I wonder how it'll actually be executed because are... sure you can, you know, walk past a pub and hear a song, but I feel like unless it triggers something that stitches together a bunch of other songs or sounds, it'll just sound disconnected and out of place. Yeah, that's not all it is. There are, like, ambient music tracks that play. Um, there's a demo that someone put up a while ago that they specifically selected the piece in the demo where this um, ambient music showed up. Um, Which is interesting, given that Mac told us that that wasn't the case. And I, what now I don't, Austin He didn't Wintry. say explicitly that... They didn't have ambient music. He, he said, did, though. No, he. I don't think he did. I think he did. You're talking about the Loomer interview? Yeah, and then Loomer got a language. He did not say that they didn't have it. Um, he said that they were doing something... New know. and different. Yeah. He um, said, I, I'm pretty sure he said it wasn't exactly the, ambient music, and we'll tell you more about that later on in the summer. And then, the, yeah, and then there was a later IGN article that described it more in depth, yeah. which talked about the various sound triggers, but... The way it said, sounded like is that you'd have an ambient music track that played and then maybe the ambient music, music track faded away, but then later you might hear somebody humming that ambient music track themselves.
So this week for our discussion, we will be talking about the recruit systems that were in place between Brotherhood and AC3. So I suppose we'll just go through the games and talk about the different uh, systems and tools and how they were used uh, and what it was like, whether they're overpowered, underpowered, dumb, awesome, and everything in between. So overall, let's start with it. What do you guys think about having you know, recruits to help you do your assassin bidding in the games? You know, I thought I wasn't that attached to it, like when they announced AC4 um, after AC3 and they announced that it wouldn't have recruits in it. I was like, that makes sense with the story, that's fine. But playing Brotherhood recently, I was like, I really like this. I wish that we still I wish that we still had this. But I I, I applaud them for, for not having it when it doesn't make sense, but I do like it a lot. So um I have my thoughts recently changed on the recruits and actually um I think with the release of Unity we're coming we're kinda of coming out of the recruits era as a whole and um it'll be interesting to see how syndicate handles that but that's not what i want to talk about right now um i actually think that the recruits don't seem to fit with an assassin's creed game like with unity it really shook what i identified as an assassin's creed game because it changed up a lot of things it changed the visuals things like that and now that i'm looking back i think that the recruits actually just kind of stand out strangely and don't really fit in with the rest of the idea of the rest of the games because for the most part it's always been you this one assassin taking down this whole organization or you part of a larger organization but you're doing most of the work with other people being behind the scenes and then suddenly we were just given an army which um it makes everything a lot easier for the most part um and i'm not sure how much it fits in with the core ideas of the Assassin's Creed games, for the most part. Okay, so I'll address that. I think thematically, there are some games where it works and some games where it very much does not. So let's go to Brotherhood. Let's, let's start with where it began. Um, this was you know, one of the big uh, upgrades to AC2 to Brotherhood was we had the multiplayer, we had you know, one big city where you could ride horses in, and we had the recruits. So I think what I really liked about the recruits in AC Brotherhood is you really felt like a badass being able to just press a button and have someone you know, go around and just kind of sneak up on them and stab them off the side of a roof. And I felt like I always had someone covering my back, which was nice. I felt like I was part of a larger organization because in AC1, or in AC2, you really are um, this assassin who doesn't know really anything about what's going on overall and who's really helping you behind the scenes until the very end when you uh, meet everyone uh, on the island in Venice, and they're like, hey, we're assassins. Machiavelli is like, yo, what's up? But in Brotherhood, you do have all these people at your back and beside you, and thematically, the plot of let's take back Rome and empower the people fits with the assassin recruits because there are these people who are you know, downtrodden and you know, beaten up by the Borgias and harassed and all that stuff, and you're saying, here, come with me, I'll give you a better life, and also we can you know, stop this from happening to other people, and they're like, sweet. I'll join you. So to me, it makes sense that that would be something that happens, that Ezio is trying to you know, liberate, you know, the liberation of Roma has begun and all that stuff. But it fit for me with AC Brotherhood especially well. What would you guys think about it them in, in Brotherhood I, specifically? I definitely agree with you on that, having just recently played Brotherhood. It really felt like, because you're doing this liberation thing, it felt like um, the closest in a game I've played to guerrilla warfare, honestly, just like... Um, attacking randomly and seemingly from nowhere before disappearing. And as far as, like, because, yes, Assassin's Creed started as this series about this singular assassin doing his thing, his assassinations, his quest. Um, but since you have this larger assassin organization as well, that, and especially with the title, Brotherhood, it's about the organization um, in that game. So I think it it's... I think it's thematically, especially in Brotherhood, very, um, I think it fits really well personally. Uh, and mm. also, also, I think uh, it, Ezio's a leader, yeah. so, you know. Yeah, that, although it's really, I, I, I do think it's kind of weird that you're not officially the leader until the end and you're doing all this stuff the whole time, but whatever. So, my thoughts on Brotherhood, it actually, thematically and plot-wise, it actually fits really, really well, as you guys mentioned. 
but I think that the challenge is balancing it so it doesn't quickly become overpowered. Like, early on, you have um, just one or two recruits, and that actually makes quite a bit of sense, and it doesn't feel too strong, especially because they are quite weak in the beginning. I really like how you can mm -hmm. level them up. But when you have 20 of them, I think that's the max, and they're all level, like, 10, then uh, it quickly becomes just get in a fight, call your recruits, everyone comes down and they kill everyone. You don't have to even touch anything. And while plot-wise, that makes a lot of sense because, you know, they're trying to serve Il Mentore and um, be cool guys, it quickly <coughs> makes the game way too easy and it kind of just has a dis disconnect between these recruits and this larger organization like but they, it seems that all they do all day is just follow Ezio around until he wants them to kill something. And I know that you can send them out on missions in Brotherhood um, to other places to get more XP and things like that. But they're not, like, also working on liberating Rome, too. It just seems strange to me. Are they just leaving it up to Ezio to go ahead and handle taking back Rome by himself unless he wants them to kill some guys? It, yeah. It... Plot-wise, I think it works, but gameplay-wise and later on, plot-wise, I guess, it doesn't work quite as well yeah. in Brotherhood. I mean, I think there's some suspension of disbelief, but at the same time, while it can be overpowered, I think there are also some, especially if you're going for full sync in that game, there are some missions where uh, it makes something that is basically impossible doable. Um... And in that, I think it makes a lot more sense connecting the gameplay and the story. Like, for instance, when you're defending Bartolomeo's um, stronghold at the beginning of the sequence where you kill the Baron de Beauvoir, um, you have to close three gates without um, taking any damage if you're doing full sync. Um, and that is nigh impossible to do by yourself because... Smoke bombs. Smoke bombs. You can do that, um, but it's a lot easier... I mean, you can do that if you do both, especially, it's a lot It's a lot easier than just because you get locked into this animation and they throw rocks at you when you try to climb things, and it's just silly. Um, but in that, I've always felt that the recruits fit really well, and there's a couple... There are a couple places where it feels cheap. Like, there's, um, for instance, in the same sequence, there's a memory that the full scene requ requirement is not to get detected, and the justification is you talk to Bartolomeo and you're going to get the... Uh, these French suits of armor, and he's like, don't get blood on them, and you're like, okay, and then the easiest way for me, especially, at, at least, to to do that and not get detected, is just let my recruits do it, because it doesn't count for them, but since they're, like, spending this whole fight smacking each other with swords, and, like, there's blood everywhere, I bet, and they're, you know, in this big fight, um, whereas a stealthy assassination would be a lot cleaner, that feels out of place, um, but and again, I guess I guess in some places it works better than others. Mm -hmm. And the, you can't forget that the the more high stakes missions, like the ones where you're infiltrating the Castello Sant'Angelo, the center of uh, Cesare and the papal armies in Rome, in their capital city, you don't even get your guys. They just are locked away, and you can't use them at all. Yeah, I think well, that I mean, it makes sense because you know, it's sense. hard enough for one person to get into the Castello, mm -hmm. but having like six behind you, like, come on. Yeah, because in, especially those missions are very linear in the way they're constructed. There's really yep. only one way in. Because um, they're interiors too. So. Yeah, and you can actually, um, I noticed in the last, second time you infiltrate the Castello, while you're outside, you have access to the recruits. But once you get inside is when you can't do them anymore. And that makes sense, because then it's like, where are they going to hide in inside this, like, bookcase where there are already books in there, and there's nowhere... Are you no sure? I thought that there. you couldn't use them on the outside either, like on the walls. And I think on the first... Well, no, no I, um... I... The, the, the... Okay, the the meter is at least there. I don't know if you can use them. I didn't actually try it, but... Uh, the meter is there for the recruit system. Yeah, so... It just seems strange to me that, like, sometimes you can use them, like, when it makes the most sense story-wise, but then other times you can't use them when it doesn't make sense story-wise. And there's just this lack of consistency, I think, between uh, 
like keeping them like not overpowered because like if you could use them in that, in that mission especially like on the outside or things like that then you could basically just wreck face and run through this so that wouldn't make much sense but then there's other missions where you also shouldn't probably be able to use them but you can like in that it kind of makes sense story wise but it makes it super easy that last mission where you have the apple and you're facing Cesare and his last remaining army uh at the gates of rome uh do you guys remember that one yeah I and there's like and there are, um you and your buddies are all like victoria ali assassini um and you can call them all in but if you've like ranked them all up and stuff then it's just like the easiest thing in the world you can just basically sit back and watch and they just... i like that because i then walk up to the gate and stare Cesare down for the entirety of the fight and just i just that just makes me feel really badass it's like, I'm coming to get you. I think we're doing a lot of nitpicking with this game. Can we just yeah. agree that overall, it was, uh, in terms of the general plot of Let's Save Rome, uh, thematically so. um, sensical and fun for gameplay to feel like a badass and people being able to take everyone out? I, definitely, right? I would definitely say so. And I think a lot of the nitpicking, at least in Brotherhood, can be just attributed to, well, it was their first try, you know? There, yeah. It was our first try with a lot of things, like the full sync requirements, this new combat system, uh, you know, what have you. So let's talk about their second try, which was Revelations. <laughs> um, in Revelations, I, I liked how the recruits were connected to the uh, multiplayer character missions. I thought that was neat. How they got some personalities. But, uh, yeah, they actually, there were characters in there, finally. Yeah, um, I kind of what I, I didn't quite like was how it, it didn't exactly make sense for there to be this this huge giant army because it wasn't so much a hey let's go free Constantinople from no it was much more of Ezio doing his own thing and happened to be there uh, so I it just it didn't seem to fit as well for me to have all these assassin recruits in no. Constantinople the right. whole time I mean there's at least the part where it's like, oh my gosh, Il Mentore is here and he's going to help us become better assassins. Like, I can see that somewhat. Um, I don't know. It doesn't quite make as much sense for them to be following him around all the time. Um, but I guess if, if Ezio's still running the entire organization, like, for instance, the Mediterranean defense, I think, was a good extension of the thing in Brotherhood. Um, yeah because it actually made sense. You could send these assassins permanently to cities, um, and then you recruit more people, and it's like, this is actually how the organization would probably work in the actual world, presumably. Like, not every assassin has the benefit of a dead family to, to get them into the organization. Um, so that somewhat made more sense, um, but there, there are definitely things about the way it's utilized in actual gameplay when it's not like the send your recruits on half hour missions that make less sense. Especially the den defense thing which is kind of an extension of the same concept just because you place assassins, you tell assassins where to go. Let's just leave that one alone There's for so now many. because I don't think anyone wants to hear us talk about den defense. Ugh. Nick, what do you think? Yeah, aftermath. Fourth wall. Yeah. <laughs> or know my name. Um, Revelations is interesting because, you know, as you guys mentioned, it's actually like almost like an interim between Brotherhood system and AC3 system, and we'll get to that in a second. But it kind of just it feels like a good progression, but then it also feels like it kind of tries to take a step, but then falls on its face with things like Den Defense, and I think the Mediterranean. Um, Mediterranean defense systems actually worked quite well and were actually a ton of fun to send people on even if they were a little mm -hmm. difficult at times especially if you weren't used to the system but then there was also the things where you like assign your leaders to like the, to the dens yeah and then you do missions with them and things like that and it's all time based and it kind of gets grindy after a while especially if it's your second playthrough and you don't want to have to like talk to these guys and slowly walk around with them for 10 minutes while they tell you what their issue is um it's not so bad you've got the walk along in that game yeah 
It's, Thank God. That also means that I can just like turn to my side and do other stuff, but it also means that I just have to listen to this exposition for ages because it's not a cinematic, it's a walk along. Yeah. Um, which might be, we might be getting a little bit nitpicky here because this is specifically like I think an that's issue a bit with, more to do with mission design than the recruits itself. Yeah, that could work that, yeah. Uh, but I liked how there was like uh, the stories themselves that you were going on your recruits with were kind of like they kind of added to the story of the city like you have the assassin who turned on the assassins and yeah. with Ezio helping each of these guys slowly like become better assassins it kind of fits in with his role as mentor because he's not only mentoring the assassins as a clan he's also mentoring these specific assassins themselves to make them better assassins yeah and I, I really like that personally even though it's hard to like um, remember those characters fondly because their names changed every time you played the game. Um, and they all spoke with the same male or female voice uh, and wore the same clothing. Um, mm. But... Oh, and those, they have those little weird capes. <laughs> yeah, those were kind of fun, though. <laughs> really? I thought they just kind of looked out of place because they were like almost like they tried to use Ezio's classic cape from AC2 and then kind of just attached well, it to the other side. I don't know. I liked. It's like not I personally long liked enough. the look. I liked. Um, it's weird. I liked the look of your basic assassins better in Assassin's Creed Brotherhood, but I liked. Because um, in, in Revelations, I don't think there were as many different variations in their outfits. Um, I like the. I like the. I just like the armor design a little bit better in Revelations, and I liked the Master Assassin outfit better in Revelations. For them, because in Brotherhood it was just a copy of uh, Ezio's outfit. Oh yeah, that looked out of place. And in Revelations, it's actually like they're wearing something that would make sense um, from their perspective. It's basically, instead of a copy of Ezio's outfit, it's a copy of Yusuf's outfit, sort of. Except that they've with put the put up. Yeah, with a new cape as well. Mm. They didn't, uh, I don't think they had a cape. Yeah, they did. They had the little. Um, they kind of went down at like a quarter of their back. That's at the. I think mean, that's at the top um, of the. Oh yeah, that thing. That's right. Armor yeah. tree, rather than like, than once they become a master mm, assassin. You might be right on that. Actually, I might be misremembering. But still, it still looked a bit weird because it yeah. wasn't quite long enough for it to make sense as a cloak. Instead, it kind of just looked more like a, um, and it didn't really make sense as like how Ezio uses his cape to kind of conceal his weapons. It kind of just looks out of place. Maybe it's just designed to look cool, flapping behind them as they run. Yeah, it's kind of hard to conceal your weapon when it's a gigantic broadsword. Then, yeah, yeah. In that game. Um, so, AC3? Gosh, AC3. Uh, that is probably... I think the recruit system at AC3 was one of the things that I think when it was talked about it was more compel it was one of the more compelling parts of the game. Well, I think the execution was really weak. Um, for instance, like I liked kind of the idea you you have the returning characters thing. Um, it was kind of cool to have like unique characters with their own costumes and stuff. Though some of the costumes were meh, um, with their own personalities, with their own stories. But their actual, I don't know. My main problem is that you know in Assassin's Creed. Brotherhood and Revelations, your assassins can do pretty much one thing, which is stab people. Um, and if you're running around the open world a lot, a lot of the time, they're going to stab people on rooftops or whatever. And then in Assassin's Creed 3, suddenly they're really bad at stabbing people and fighting people. And uh, they get injured all the time. And that made me like them a lot less. I liked some of the, like, they do other cool things, like the, uh, the, the, the disguise thing where they pretend you're a prisoner, um, the bodyguard function, but whereas, like, stabbing people is pretty universal to every situation, the other things are, were kind of, um, only really useful in a couple situations, and ended up Although they were cool, they just I, I didn't have a need to use them 
very often, and so it felt like, well, here's a feature, but I don't care. The Sorry, thing with that the was... EC3 recruits is I thought one thing that was neat was they tried to merge the um, the factions in the city with the recruits. Mm-hmm. So in AC3, you didn't have people like, you know, uh, courtesans, mercenaries, and thieves. All of those functions were really within the recruits. And I thought that was neat, although it was a mix of somehow overpowered yet underpowered, so I just never really used them, uh, except for the um, the specific missions where you have to. But I, eh, it was... A good idea done all right at best. But I did really like the characterizations because those were really fun to talk to people and get to know them after freeing their part of the city. Mm-hmm. Um, so in AC3, I think that, like with Brotherhood, it actually makes the most sense story wise. Um, they, mm-hmm. like with Connor being less all about the creed and its traditions, it kind of makes sense that they wouldn't have uniforms and things like that when they wouldn't be as organized but he's also rebuilding the brotherhood in north america so he's recruiting people who have um Mm -hmm. and it also works with the american revolutionary setting as well because he's working with the disgruntled civilians um to try and and rise up and since the brotherhood itself is two people at the beginning you're not going to see like suddenly a billion recruits at the same time so the people that um are your recruits are going to probably be people that you are more familiar with, and that might explain why they're... That kind of fits with why they're actual characters rather than talking faces. Mm, I really liked how deep the characters were as well. Like There was that one guy who uh, witnessed Hatham's assassination of Nico. Yeah. yeah, that was cool. I like that. And you have Dobby where there's Hatham. some sexual tension there um, with Connor. Um, and then we live later. She's literally like, so... Uh... When do you want to hook up? And Connor's like, how about later? <laughs> yeah. That was funny. So Except he was a bit more like, how about after I'm done with stuff? Then we can then we can hook up. Report to the ship as soon as possible. Well, bang, okay? Those of you who get that, good job. I do not. Play um, Mass Effect, uh, damn you. Old video on Machinima. Oh, I haven't played Mass Effect at all. Watch very many Machinimas. Gamer Poop. I think Gamer Poop Mass Effect does it a bunch. Yep. So, I really liked how AC3 handled it, although it did feel really weird, like how once you... You could take back the colonies, and I think even some of the Canadian colonies too, using yeah. these guys. Um, but then once... Actually, you, did, you couldn't take them back. You were actually... Um, those missions are actually centered around helping Canada to stay neutral. Interestingly. That's interesting. Oh. Um... But then the weird thing is that as soon as it's done, you can't send them on those missions anymore. So you can't level them up anymore or uh, bring in money or things. Because I think they... And, well, the missions themselves are also... They're a much um, less... Uh, they're a much lower return on experience than just using your recruits all the time. Which, for me, since they couldn't stab did. people properly... Don't I they also bring in, like, supplies and money, though? I thought. Yeah, I so I what that. I did uh, was. They do a bit, uh, but I don't care about that as much. When I was playing, uh, what's the game? Um, the the chess type thing with Achilles. Damn it, Achilles, uh, not Panorama? Achilles. Damn it, Shay. Uh, but. Achilles. Um, uh, yeah. Uh, when I was playing that, what, I'll, what I'd always do is I'd send them on the shortest missions possible because uh, if you sent. Um, uh, you, you could send uh, an assassin on, I think three times as many missions in, you know, two-thirds of the time or something, some number that makes it, you know, more sensical to send them on a lot of short missions rather than a few big missions, and you get more money and more experience quicker. So I would play, like, two rounds and then walk out of the building, uh, out of the homestead, send them on more missions, walk back in, play some more rounds, walk back out, send them on more missions. And because it took for freaking ever to beat Achilles at that stupid, stupid game to get that dumb trophy, um, I I was able to level up my assassins pretty high. (laughs) So, that's AC3. Any, any further words on how AC3 out of the recruit? I think that's it. I think I've made my point. So, then we have AC4, where they took this strange method with it, where you're kind of... It was kind of like, um, early on, it was described similar to how AC3 handled it, but there was a bit of a miscommunication there, because it wasn't like that at all, and how your pirate crewmates were actually just a stat in the top left. 
um, and not really anything like the recruits had yeah. ever been before. Yeah. And so that kind of completely did away with them, even though we didn't think they would early on well, at release. Did, yeah, but then, like, they did later say, like, um, you know, we're not really having the recruit system because it doesn't make sense because Edward yeah. doesn't start as a as an assassin. Exactly, but there was still, of course, the miscommunication there, and yeah. people still held on to the fact that maybe he has, maybe the pirate crew works similar somehow. Yeah. Um, but that didn't turn out to be true at all. I do appreciate their conviction, their dedication to at least AC4 story to be like, yeah, it doesn't make sense, so we're not going to do that. Um, you do do the activities that you would do to gain a crew, recruits, and they've broadly expanded on that, because not only can you fight guards to save recruits, you can also rescue them off of deserted islands and things, so hmm. that was actually kind of interesting, just because, like, I don't... There's not a ton of places you can rescue them from deserted islands, but like when you stumble across one, it's like, oh hey, this is a little. It's, it was like a little detail in the world, but um, and they're yeah, also, I mean, also like floating off in the ocean a ton. Oh yeah, it's way exactly. more common than I thought it would be in the time because it has smaller carabiners. <laughs> AC Force carabiner at least. Um, yeah, so that was interesting. And then we had Freedom Cry, which handled it, which was kind of an extension of that. Again, we're kind of getting off topic, but it kind of continued on from that idea with the freeing the slaves to add on to numbers because I just got the idea after you mentioned how you um, recruit people and then that yeah. was and then some of them would go to the Maroons and some of them would just become freed slaves and mm-hmm. probably start a business or something and then we have then Unity you feel sad by breaking the system yeah. also by committing genocide yeah, yeah. which is sad and then we had Unity which completely forgo it but that made plenty of sense uh, story wise because mm-hmm. Anna was brand new. Yeah. And now we have Syndicate, which has, instead of assassin recruits, we have a gang members. And from yeah. our understanding so far, it's supposed to be similar. Have you guys heard much about that? Similar yes. to what? Um, Elaborate. Similar to, like, Previous. AC3's Brotherhood's Revelations. Yeah. Okay. Um, like, I you can, I'd be okay with that. You can make your gang members go with you, so just follow you around. So, like, when you get in a carriage, they will either hop in... Oh, right, yeah, we talked about left. this. Yeah, yeah exactly. Um, it seems like it'll play not so much like the recruits, but like faction members that always stick with you. And I think I'd actually prefer yeah. to do that, because mm. as we talked about it last time, long time ago, whenever that was over the summer, that um, in certain districts that you do more with, um, you'll find your rooks hanging out around more often, so you can kind of pick them up off the street yeah. uh, with more ease. They're easier to find and whatnot. So I would suspect that they do play a lot more like the factions because it would make more sense that you really get the feeling of the rooks are everywhere as opposed mm-hmm. to just press a button and, oh, look, there they are. Yeah. Um, and also it's, uh, it's more uh, grounded and realistic that you actually have to go to get them to have them follow you. Yeah, I think it's going to feel somewhat it's going to be like if you're still comparing it to Assassin's Creed I think it's going to be like um uh you know Assassin's Creed Brotherhood Revelations uh if you couldn't use them for stealth I think they're just they're probably just going to be open combat oriented um and I think they're probably going to feel more like something that's not from Assassin's Creed, but if you've played Saints Row, you can call in gang members and they'll follow you around in cars, jump in the cars that you pilot, uh, help you out in combat, and you can find them walking around in the world as well as calling them up. So that's kind of what it, it reminds me of. You know, they can wear your colors and stuff. So, Do you guys think they got to follow around Evie or just Jacob? Huh. That's what I was just about to ask. I, I don't know, because I mean, I you think that you'd be able to use them for both, but... Yeah, they're both supposed well, they're to be both, the leaders of the game. Yeah, I would yeah. expect that you, you, I'm, but I'm, she, I'm pretty sure you'll be able to do it for either in the open world, but probably you won't be able to do it in as many EV missions as you will be able to do it in Jacob missions. Because mm, her missions yeah. will probably be more stealth focused. Yeah, like, I don't think exactly. you're going to get any recruits or any game members in the black box missions. I suspect Evie would like to work alone because she's more focused on the shroud, whereas Jacob is like, hey gang, hey London, let's have it all. So I think story-wise, it would make more sense that Jacob would have more of a focus on using gang members in missions uh, than Evie would. All 
All right, that is all for this episode. Thank you all very much for joining us. Uh, all of the music used in the episode can be found in the video description down below. As usual, you can reach us on the Assassin's Creed subreddit, which is assassinscreed.reddit.com or reddit.com slash r slash Assassin's Creed, as well as on Twitter and through our email, animusislandpodcast at gmail.com. Uh, if you'd like to be a guest or ask us any question to answer at all, uh, please send those uh, to us through Twitter or Reddit or email or literally anything, uh, and we will talk about your topic. So as always, uh, thank you for tuning in, and we will see you next week. Bye.